Here's a few uh, news items that you might like. Uh, this one's been getting a lot of uh, attention lately in the security community. Some people have been complaining that people should not write hacking tools and publish them. And some people say, uh, like I certainly like to have them so I can give them to my students to do homework and such. But um, other people say criminals use them to attack people and they've gathered the evidence. And so they've got a whole uh, dynamic chart here of all the real malware tools that include hacking tools written by uh, individuals. And of course, they mention a few of the uh, most important ones, like um, reflective dill injection is interesting. I'm going to talk more about dill injection today. I've got another project working there. Well, I haven't used this particular library. And Power, Empire, PowerSpoit, and Quasar are remote access tools. I've heard of Empire. Um, I haven't tried it yet. Mimi Cats, of course, I've used for years. Everybody loves that. So those are really powerful open source tools, and they're often built into malware. So anyway, uh, people are complaining that you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't publish open source projects, or if you do, you should somehow cripple them or mark them. And uh, there's quite an argument going on about this in the security community. Anyway, um, this, uh, I was quite interested. I did, uh, uh, I, I did a lot of work with a... Uh, Router advertisement IP version 6 denial of service attack several years ago, and somebody has found another one. If you have Windows 10 and you give it an IP version 6 router advertisement packet, you can get unauthenticated remote code execution on the machine, apparently. Which that's pretty exciting, and they don't give you the details, um, but that's pretty awful. Although, of course, as they say, you should not be accepting router advertisements from strangers. They should only be happening on your local network. They're sort of like DHCP requests. They're, they're things that set up networking and they should only be happening inside your company. You shouldn't be taking them in from the internet anyway. So that uh, might limit the practicality of this attack, but it is pretty exciting. Uh, PG&E may be turning off our power again. So be aware of that starting on Wednesday um, because the weather, I guess, to prevent fires. So you may all be losing your power for a day or two. So we might want to take a look at that in more detail. The random number generators in Linux are not that good, and they are trying to make one of them less predictable. Uh, there are a lot of random numbers used in operating systems at different levels, and some of them have to be really random, cryptographically secure. Others don't really have to be. But this one here, they're trying to improve its level of randomness. Uh, these, this random number quality has always been a big issue in cryptography. And it's become a bigger um, discussion in security since a project about eight years ago that discovered that 0.1% of all the public keys used by HTTPS certificates in the wild are duplicates. Because the original random numbers used to create the random prime numbers are not random enough and produce the same number uh, occasionally, which they should never do. This one caught my attention. This, pro this HXD, hex editor, that we use in a lot of projects in this class and many others. I didn't know this. It's is apparently a platform and you can write Python code to extend it. So somebody wrote an extension that adds base 64 to it or something, which I guess it didn't have. And uh, anyway, I just thought it was sort of interesting. I guess you can have extensions for this, like you have extensions for Firefox and Wireshark and Holly Debug. I never heard of an HXD extension before, but apparently you can do it and you just have to write stuff in Python. So. That's an interesting fact. There is now going to be a computer saint. This 15-year-old computer whiz was very Catholic, and he died, and there have now been miracles at his grave, so he is going to be the patron saint of the Internet, and he has been beatified, which is part of the process of becoming a Catholic saint. So uh, there you go. A new thing for the tech community. And this was pretty amazing. At first, I thought this was duplicative of one I saw a while ago showing you how the United States failed in coronavirus. But these are the United States states. And they are marked by whether they are ruled by Democrats or Republicans. And the thing you can see here, which is certainly what any of us would get um, in an uh, anecdotal manner by just watching the news, is that um, thanks to Donald Trump, the Republicans refuse to wear masks and they refuse to social distance, and they die of coronavirus. And you can see all the red states at the top and the blue states at the bottom as you go through the spread of this virus. And just today, 
And yesterday, Trump is off and infected members of the Republican Party are going to closed rooms to meet with other senators and refusing to wear masks. It is just incredible. Um, Many people around the world are just amazed. I'm amazed there will be textbooks written about this and courses about this. What in the world is going wrong with America? At one time we were considered like scientific and advanced, but we seem to have had complete lunatics take over the country. And they have an enormous fraction of the country that just goes along with them when what they're doing just makes no sense at all. It's homicidal and suicidal and they just don't care. It's a uh, interesting study in mass insanity. Anyway, um, there's that. Let's see. It is, uh, oh, just another minute for you after you go on. I think we can get going. I think God, whoever's coming, probably. All right. So let's start. I'm just going to point out a few things here. Um, there is a guest speaker coming um, in two weeks. There we are, November 3rd, on Election Day. Caitlin will be here to tell us about uh, hacking things that are not on Earth. And that should be a lot of fun. And that's on Tuesday night, so it'll be in this class. So I've got it listed in the schedule here as a guest speaker without the details. I'll copy that information over later. I've been distracted by writing uh, exciting projects, which I'll be talking about. But we'll start with this Chapter 7, and then I'll show you a few more projects. So that chapter seven stuff should be open here. And there it is, all right. All right, so the Windows application programming interface. I mentioned before, if you want to um, control something about the hardware from a Windows machine, you want to put something on a screen or receive keyboard input or something like that, you can't, you are not authorized to touch the hardware directly. This is by design. Processes that directly touch the hardware are kernel processes. They run in ring zero. And anything you launch from the start button that has your privileges is not allowed to touch that directly. Instead, you have to go through Windows API code. So Microsoft writes all the kernel code, and you have to ask the Microsoft code to please touch the hardware and do things. So that's the API. There are a couple of different APIs, but anyway, here's um, so you get used to the Microsoft notation. So you've got Hungarian notation and types of things, handles, and we'll talk about these other issues. So, uh, all right, this is called Hungarian notation where you put these prefixes, DW, if they use double words, which are 32-bit words, and you put suffixes at the end to say what kind of strings they use. And that's how you can understand these, uh, these names. So, uh, that's because Windows is old, and Windows, far more than any other operating system, is very concerned with backward compatibility. So Microsoft will run stuff that was written for earlier versions, and so they still carry a huge legacy of old versions and function calls. So word, double word, handle, and long pointer are typically prefixes you'll see to labels in the Windows API. And handles are what you get if you have done some C programming, you open a file and you get a pointer to the file. And then when you write to the file, you put in the pointer. So Microsoft calls that a handle. And so anything you open, which has some kind of label to refer to it later in code, is a handle. There are handles to processes, files, windows, and so on. Um, so it, you can, if you do the create window function, in some old version of Windows or DOS, I guess it would have been Windows, that would create a window. Then at some point they extended it, so now there's a create window EX function, and you'll sometimes see EX, EX. So when you run this function, it has parameters, like how big is the window, is there a scroll bar, and things like that. And then you, it returns a handle, which is a handle to the window. So later on, if you want to do something like minimize the window, or close the window, or destroy it, or something, you refer, refer to it by its handle. So you can create a file, read a file, write a file, or you create a file mapping or map view of file. This is something that would load a file into RAM, which is not a normal activity. And that's the kind of thing malware might do. And that's one of the ways you catch malware is it uses strange API calls and strange combinations of API calls 
that normal code would not use. And that's not a very precise way to catch it. And this is why if you download open source software, especially old open source software, like old compression utilities and things, often they'll set off antivirus because they do things that are no longer considered the best way to do things, but they seemed like a good idea to somebody 15 years ago when they wrote that program. I used to get uh, a lot of my open source tools used to set off antivirus standards because they were compressed and they had a decompression routine in the front of them. And so it looked like malware. There are some special file names in the Microsoft world. Um, these have to be back slices, I think, not forward slices. Anyway, normally it's, normally it's easy. It's this way in Microsoft world, backslash, backslash. Uh, there. That's the normal way you do it in Microsoft. Two backslashes take you to the root of the system, then a name of the server, and then the share. You can also put in a question mark here, and this will allow you to have longer file names. There is something not mentioned directly on this slide, but incredibly cruel. Um, in Microsoft, in the ancient days of MS-DOS, file names could only be eight characters long, and then have a period, and only have three characters after it. And the actual file names used inside the Microsoft operating system still have that limitation. And the longer file names are an illusion that are constructed by adding pieces to the 8.3 file names. And if you do something like a command line command referring to a pattern of file names, you're actually referring to patterns of those 8.3 file names when you think you're referring to the longer name, which can lead to strange, unexpected results. But anyway, that's an issue here to deal with long file names. Um, so the lowest namespace is the root of everything, slash, slash, dot, you know. I'm really bothered by these. Um, oh, those are uh, now, uh, pardon me, it's just me. Good. I'm glad it's just me and being confused now. Those are, in fact, backslashes. Now I feel better. They are really backslashes. Okay, I was accidentally making forward slashes. That's correct. Backslash. Yes, thank you. Craig got it right. Back, they were right in the first place. Made me feel better. Okay, so this is what you have. This is what you use to do direct disk input output, which in Linux would be um, devices like slash dev slash FD1 and HD1. All right. So if you write directly to the disk, not to a volume, that's how you'd corrupt the disk. You'd write directly to the storage on the disk instead of referring to the named volume that might have a drive letter. Okay, good. Thank you. I appreciate it, Craig. Don't let me get away with anything. Don't want to get anything wrong here. All right, so alternate data streams is a feature that Microsoft added to be compatible with Apple because of music. Apple would have music, and then they would have separate streams of data attached to the same file. There'd be the WAV file or whatever it is with this music, and then there'd be another stream of data for the cover art or for the album notes. And so Microsoft has this ability. You can create a file, and then you can refer to that file as if it was a drive. So after you've made a file, you put a colon and then another name after it. You can store files inside the file as if it was a drive. Those are the alternate data streams. And there was a period of time, maybe 10 years ago, when antivirus tools and other tools did not know about this. So you could hide malware in an alternate data stream and it wouldn't be picked up. But that's not that common anymore. And another important thing to get used to is the Windows registry that uh, just takes a while to get used to it. In Linux, they don't use the registry. Instead, every program has its own configuration file. So if you have Apache, it has Apache configuration files and everything else. And those things are just scattered wherever each application developer felt like putting them. So these configuration files are just sort of scattered at random through the file system. And um, there's not no obvious place to find them, to change them or remove them or anything. And, and around the time of Windows 95, Microsoft decided they didn't like this. So they created this binary database called the registry, and all the settings for every program and every part of Windows are supposed to be in the registry. And the registry has a limit to its size and it tends to get corrupt, and that's then a whole generation of registry cleaning utilities appeared. But anyway, for better or worse, we now have the registry. This is where everything you do in control panel goes, adding programs, changing your background color, and anything else. And malware can make registry changes for persistence. And the most common problem with Windows is that when you install stuff, the installer changes the registry. And when you uninstall it, it does not thoroughly clean all those changes out of the registry. So your registry gets junk in it, left over from things you're not using anymore until it accumulates errors and causes your Windows to have crashes and slow down. So that's why they sold, sell and distribute registry cleaning utilities, which most Microsoft experts say you should not use because they'll do more harm than good. 
And uh, at least back in the days of XP, it was fairly common for most serious Windows users like me and the people I learned from to say, you just need to reinstall your system every year or so to keep it running well. Um, I don't know if it's really more stable in Windows 10. I haven't used Windows, I don't use systems that long anymore either because I'm always doing something horrible to them like infecting them with malware. So I keep rebuilding them frequently. So here's the registry terms. You've got the root keys of the registry that are always these. Um, class, HP classes root, current user, local machine, users, and current config. These are in fact not even remotely equal to like five folders that contain things. It is far, far more messed up. Um, anyway, these things look like folders are called root keys. Every key must have a value, even if it's just a default with value not set. Because although this looks like folders, they aren't. And uh, regedit is the tool you use to maintain them. So here are the root keys. Um, this is the settings in the local machine. These are settings specific to the current user. H key users define settings for all the users. And H key current user actually points to a subset of H key users. And current config stores information about current hardware configuration. The point of this is something called hardware profiles that I haven't heard of anyone using in 10 years. You can have multiple hardware profiles on your machine, so when you boot it up, you tell it which hardware it's connected to right now. And the idea was for laptops that had docking stations. Anyway, um, there are a few keys that are particularly important, like this one, software Microsoft Windows current version run. These are things that will run every time you boot up your machine. So it's a great place for malware to put resistance. And here's run once, it will run once when you boot up the machine and I think not thereafter. And there are a bunch of related run keys in, I think there's like six of them. And if there are a bunch of other ways to make things automatically launch in Windows, and the best tool here is auto runs. Um, this is a Microsinovich tool like all the best Windows utilities and it will find all the locations that are automatically launching things, or at least it's better than any other tool at finding them. I don't suppose it can possibly find them all, but it finds most of them. And it does produce a long list of all the things that are automatically launching on your machine, which is usually a whole lot more than people realize. <coughs> anyway, a way to review what automatically things are. Uh, these things are called auto start extensibility points. And so, uh, here are some API calls. Reg open key X will open a registry key. This will set a value and get a value. And documentation, if you read documentation about the function, it won't include the trailing W or A, but it's really there. W for 16-bit characters and A for 8-bit characters. All right. And that's the uh, Windows function. So you'll often see this EX or this W or so on, and it's a good thing to be aware of. Uh, so here's code that modifies registry settings in one of their malware samples. So here it is calling reg open key. And up here you can see the key. This is a string, software, Microsoft, Windows, current version, run. Note the double backslashes. You often need those because you need one to escape the other. So otherwise it would interpret the first backslash as just a mark that you should not interpret this character as a control character. And um, then you call calculate some string length and then data value name and then you set a value. So it's going to find this key and then it's going to set a value to a string value that's calculated here. Uh, this is the sort of thing you might do if you create a randomly named file and then you create a registry key to automatically launch that randomly named file. All right. You can save your registry changes as reg files from inside regedit. You can change something and then save the contents of one registry key. And this is often what you do if you want to distribute some patch at a company. Like one thing that's fairly common is Microsoft puts out an update. And the update is dangerous and fouls things up. So you want to block automatic update from putting on that update. So you find a registry key, you make a registry file, and then email it to your people and they double click on it if you want to do it that way. That's a pretty amateurish small business way to do things. The modern way to do something like that is in group policy on your domain controller where you automatically push out software that runs the next time they log in. But this, this older technique is still around. And if you save a reg file, you can open it in Notepad and see what it is and it's really very simple. 
it's completely readable and it just describes what's going to be changed. So that's uh, one important part of Windows to know about. So let me get my cahoots. And we are at 7A. All right, good. All right. Cahoots. Favorites should be here. Oh, uh, there's, oh, good, they are here. Okay. Okay. couple more but I uh, I'll give it about another 10 seconds oh okay good well there could be a maxwell one more all right I guess that's it all right a pointer to an object That's a handle, okay? All right, the second stream of data. All right, alternate data streams. And a root key. one of them, H key current user. And a sys internals tool. to think that's a duplicate. All right, well. All right. Anyway. All right, Dylan. And Arch. Good. All right. Those are like real names. So let's go on here. And good. All right. So uh, for networking, uh, there are several different ways to do it. The old fashioned way to do it was WinSock because that follows the original Linux convention, which was the dawn of the internet. Windows completely ignored the internet in the early days. 
and Linux got ahead, Linux defined the internet, and Microsoft was very late to add this stuff in. So these do the identical stuff in the WS232 library. You find the functions that totally match the original functions from, from uh, Linux, and you see them if you use Python to um, make these raw sockets. These things are called raw sockets. So you create a socket object, you bind to the socket, then you can accept data if you're the server, and listen. If you are a client, then you connect to a server somewhere, and then you receive and send data. So uh, there's a series of these things, and this is what's really going on underlying network connections you go over TCP IP. But that is a whole lot of work, that kind of stuff, and a normal programmer would not bother using these functions because it's too much bother. You have to do your own timing, you have to do your own handshakes, it's kind of ridiculous. So, but you will see it. Here's what it looks like in the server program. You do a startup. You always have to start with WGA startup to get it ready. Then you create a socket object, then you bind a port to the socket, then you listen, then you accept data. You know, it's quite a lot of programming to make this stuff go. What normal programmers use, they don't touch any of that stuff. They use the WinINet API, which is the higher level API intended for convenience of normal users. And now you can do with one command something that makes more sense, like internet read a file, internet open a URL, the sort of thing you might do. And that will then call those lower level libraries under um, the control of code that Microsoft wrote, so you don't have to write it. So, if you want to transfer execution to another part of code, use jump or call in normal situations, but there are many other ways. The one we're playing with a lot lately, and we'll play more with it today, is to use dynamically load linked libraries, which lets you add new code into a running process, which is outrageously dangerous, as we know, and we're going to exploit some more. There are a bunch of processes. There are multiple threads. Modern Microsoft software breaks into many threads that move forward independently. So one program that is supposedly doing only one thing is actually doing several things at the same time. There are mutexes, which are marks that label something that multiple processes can communicate with. And there are these services running in the background, offering service to all the running processes. And the component object model objects are similar. And then there are exceptions that have been around forever. These are sort of emergency signals that tell the computer that it has to stop whatever's going on and do something else, like it's time to shut down or something else. So DILs are the most obvious way to exploit a Windows system and the most common way it's done. Um, your library is compiled with exports that are functions that can be used by other programs. And you could, in principle, compile your code with static DILs. So you write some software, you connect to a library, and when you compile it, it makes a copy of the library code and puts it in your program so that you have your own copy that nobody else is sharing. That would be the most sanitary and secure way to do this, but it would mean that your program would be bigger, slower to load, bigger on the disk, and all that. Of course, it would also mean that you always have the right version of the library and that that library is not corrupt put there by somebody else. But you know, you can in principle supposedly use this on Windows, but I've never seen it done. Uh, Windows is not, is always done the other way, more dangerous, but faster and more efficient as long as nothing goes wrong. So that's the point. Uh, if you use dynamic link libraries, then your code is smaller, it loads faster, it's smaller on the disk, it doesn't consume as much RAM when it runs because it just shares libraries that are already there. And you, of course, the other thing which Microsoft is specifically designed for, Microsoft is a platform to make money like Facebook. They have never pretended to be anything else. So they are designed to cooperate with companies that want to make a business out of selling software. So you could write software and make a library and distribute the dill and sell it to people. And people do. And they very much encourage you to reuse code for another purpose again and again, because it's all intended to be a commercial platform that makes it easy to make stuff and sell it. So, of course, if I can put malicious code in a DIL, all I have to do is trick your process into loading the DIL. Um, and, of course, all your malware uses DILs. You can't do much of anything without using Windows API calls, and they're all in DILs, so your malware is using the DILs. And you can use third-party DILs. In fact, if you find, for example, that Microsoft has improved their security, and the DILs you would like to exploit that Microsoft wrote are now protected, you could take some other software 
that is installed on a lot of machines like Firefox and exploit their DILs. And this is uh, why normal home users all have certain things installed on their machine. For a long time, everybody had Flash and a lot of other things. And this is why if you get in a high security company, like now I'm working for the military, they, what, the simplest thing they usually make you do is they force you to use the Microsoft product for everything and not put anything else on. So you have to use Microsoft, you have to use Skype for uh, video calls and Microsoft team for meetings. And you have to use the Microsoft version of everything and never anything else for this reason, because all the Microsoft stuff is brought up to a certain level of compliance and random third party stuff that people are used to using probably isn't. So DILs are like EXEs. You'll be writing one later here. And it's the same. It's also a portable executable file. It's just a flag in the header telling it that it's a library instead of an EXE. It has a lot of exports, which normal programs only have one export, which is the start point where to start the program. Uh, now, it has one special function called DIL main. DIL main is executed as soon as a DIL is loaded. That is supposed to be the sort of constructor that prepares the dill for use, creating whatever is necessary for it. So malware, for example, if you make a malicious dill with, with Metasploit, which we've been doing, Metasploit dills have no exports, which is pretty miserable and not pretty lousy imitation of a dill because they don't actually offer any functionality in anything. All they do is have dill main. And when they load, they do a malicious thing in dill main and that's it. So that's what Metasploit dills do. All right, so everything's a process. And every process has its handles in memory, and it has one or more threads. Threads are the actual part of the program that is allocated in the CPU. So you have to have at least one thread, even if you're a single-threaded process. All right. So you can see the processes. If you go to Task Manager, you see all the tasks running, and a typical Windows machine has a bunch of them running, but most of them are services running in the background. Um, now, it is a multi um, processing machine in that it runs many processes, but in fact, unless you have multiple processors, which most people do now, multiple cores, it can really only be doing one thing at a time, and it's strobing back and forth between these, giving each of them a tiny fraction of a second to do processing, and that's done by threads. Each thread gets a few CPU cycles, and then the next thread gets a few, and then the next thread gets a few. So each one has memory management, it has its own memory, it has a certain access to the CPU and the file system, and so on. So if each process has a virtual memory space, which we were talking about before, they each think they're running at a certain location, usually 400,000, and that is not really true. They're actually somewhere else, but inside they feel like they're in a virtual memory space, sort of like a virtual machine. And they're, they feel like they have a whole four gigabytes or something of memory to use, but they don't. And nowhere in that whole memory allocation is anybody else's memory. They're in a sort of sandbox, an illusion. Um, all right, so you can create a process with an API call, and you have a parameter that sets uh, how it's going to get input and output and error streams and so on. And here's some uh, assembly code to do it. So you... Uh, have a socket handle, you make it to you set your startup info. Once you've loaded all this stuff into a process information object, things like current directory and error output and input uh, handles, then you call create process A after you've prepared all the information. And notice this is the same thing we talked about before for assembly language. You're pushing all this stuff on the stack. Push, 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 more push, push, push to put all the pieces of this whole data structure on the stack, and then you call the thing. And it then looks on the stack for all those parameters and uh, finds them and builds your process. All right, so processes are containers. They contain a thread, and threads are what Windows executes. These are independent sequences of instructions that can move forward without relying on another thread, and the point of them is to try to make the machine faster. One enormous problem in all kinds, all computing is that you have a fast thing waiting for a slow thing. You have something fast like the processor waiting for a slow thing like the network card or the disk or the human user to do something, and you would like to avoid that as much as possible. So you try to have independent threads that can keep doing something productive even while other threads are waiting for some slow thing to happen. Each thread has a context. And one th other threads can't affect it. So 
if you switch to another thread, so you give one thread some computer cycles, and now it's time for move the CPU to another, you have to save the thread context. That's called a context switch. All right, so create thread, you specify a start address and a start function, and then you use create thread. So you could use create thread to load a dill. That would be one way to add something to a, a, a running process. And then there are mutexes that you'll see quite a bit in the projects with the uh, malware provided by the, the uh, textbook author. Uh, mutexes are marks put in memory, which create an object which can be interacted with by several different processes. And so this would be something of importance. And in malware, it typically is how you mark. This machine is already infected. Do not bother to try to infect it again with the same malware. So it looks for this mutex, the hard-coded name. So you can give a thread access to the mutex, you can release it, you can create a mutex, or you can open mutex to get a handle to a mutex that some other process has already created. So mutexes are used to get around this limitation I was describing earlier, where you look in your process's memory space and it's all yours. You can't see anybody else's data. If you actually need to move data to another process, one way to do it is through a mutex here, which is sort of a publicly advertised handle to memory. So here's what you'd find to make sure that only one process is running. You'd, um, down here is the name, and you would call create mutex. You call open mutex up here to see if it exists. And then if it doesn't exist, then you call create mutex to create it. All right, let's take a look at 7b, which should be here. Good. more seconds. Looks like that's it. All right, bind and accept. That's the WS232, the old Windsock library. Those are the old fashioned raw sockets. Which library contains internet read file? That's WinINET, the high level one. Type of file differing from an EXE by one flag value. Mm -hmm. 
Dills libraries are just like EXEs, except for one flag value telling it it's a library. All right, and a global object used to coordinate multiple processes. Mutex, also called a mutant. All right. All right. Okay. Pigeon Lab, tell me who they are. Terra, I think that's a real name. All right. Good. All right. So I got a little more of this before we do the project. So services are running in the background. You can see them in task manager. They have these names. These are parts of Windows running and most of them launch before you log in. So they have to run with one of these special accounts like net services or local system or something like that. They don't run with your name because they're running before you log in. So the system account is the most powerful account more powerful than the administrator that can do anything essentially. And this is of course what you would like to have. And if you do the exploit class like 123 and 124, you'll find you exploit a machine, you get a shell, but you really want a system shell so you can get to the privileged objects like the password hashes. So anyway, if you can somehow connect your malware to a service, then it will automatically run when Windows starts and it may run with high privileges too. So that's a common thing to do. So there are API calls to mesh with services. This will give you a handle to the service control manager. Um, here you can create a service. Here you can start a service. There are plenty of services that exist, but they only start when they're needed. They don't always start every time you boot up. And so here's the most common type of service is Windows 32 share process, because these store their code for service in a Dell, and they combine several instances into a single shared process. So this is what Process Explorer is very good at. If you look, you'll see a whole bunch of these SBC host processes, and you can tell what they are by hovering over it, and it will now tell you the, it groups these services together, and these services that all run into, can run with the same privileges all run with one instance of this host process, and it's running these services. So there are 10 or 12 of these things running, each of them running 10 or 12 services, and that adds up to all the background services or at least most of them. I don't think they all run that way, but a lot of them do. So here's ones that run as EXE in an independent process instead of being grouped together like that. And there are kernel drivers too that load code into the kernel. So the service information is in the registry. You can go to this services key. And then if you go to say the browser, you'll see information here about this browser service that runs. And each service has its own. Here's all these things, the background intelligent transfer service and all these other, each one has their own uh, registry location, which launches their parameters, what type of service it is, and so on. So the SC command is the command line you have in Windows to control services. So you can get information about the browser service. It tells you what kind of service it is. It's going to be shared with one of these SBC host processes. And, uh, other services it depends on, and so on. There's a lot of these things. All right, the component object model is another way for components to share code. So these com objects have to call a lay initialize. This is called object linking and embedding, or co initialize, and then they can call other com libraries. And they're accessed by these globally unique identifiers, which are 128 bit values. Um, and they're uh, a bunch of class identifiers and interface identifiers and many others. Then there are exceptions. These, if, it, if something happens um, that requires emergency handling, like a divide by zero, then it performs and it, it sends a signal called an exception and the software is supposed to do something about it. If you 
write your own code, you can write an exception handler in your code, and that's the structured exception handler. If you do not write a structured exception handler, it will be passed on to the operating system, which will then hit the Microsoft operating system exception handler, which in older versions of Windows would call up something called Dr. Watson. And it'll pop up a system error message. So FS0 stores the exception location, FS being one of the segment registers in the processor. So here you've got a reference to FS0. This is storing exception handling information there to writing to a location uh, FS0. And if you take the exploit development class, we do exploit the exception handler. All right, so then there's kernel and user mode, like I mentioned. The actual hardware in the processor allows you to have four rings of security, 0, 1, 2, and 3. But in practice, nobody ever really quite understood what the point of 1 and 2 was, and no modern operating system uses them. All they use is ring 0 and ring 3. Ring 3 is instructions that are considered relatively harmless, and they're available for user land code to run. And ring 0 is reserved to the kernel. All right, so, um, Everything you run after you log in by clicking a start button or typing anything in command line, that's all running in user mode with your privileges, and you can't access hardware directly. And the only way you get there is by calling the kernel, which is stuff written by Microsoft and unfortunately by the third party people that made your hardware who provided device drivers that have to go in the kernel, which is the number one cause of blue screens of death giving Microsoft a really bad attitude. I mean, most of the time your machine crashes is because of the non-Microsoft code you're running, which makes Microsoft get kind of a bad attitude about it. And that's why they're more and more vigorous in each version of Windows at limiting and controlling what you put in your drivers. But normal code that, you, that people write is all in great in user land here. All right, so uh, your user mode processes, each one of them is isolated from each other with their own restricted memory, and if they crash, it doesn't crash the operating system because the kernel is still intact. So it can just pop up an error message and let you restart it or something. Um, your other processes will continue to run and so on. But, and you can't jump directly in the kernel. What you do is you run a call to the kernel, which has different names and different versions of Windows sysenter, syscall, the old one is int 2e. These will then um, call the kernel and the parameters in the registers will tell it which kernel function you're trying to run. And this is essentially what all those APIs do. Set something up and then call the kernel. So all the kernel processes share resources and memory addresses. They are running in a sort of unsafe, unsanitary world. Um, when I found that denial of service with IP version six packets years ago, I showed it to Windows experts and stuff and they told me this is common if one kernel process starts consuming too many resources, it kills the whole operating system. And I said, doesn't it have any control for that? And they said, no, the kernel really doesn't. They're all just sharing stuff. And if you run out of resources, it just crashes. That appears to be true. Um, very strange. Anyway, so you're, you cannot recover from a kernel crash. And um, by the way, not only your device drivers, but also your antivirus software and your firewall all have kernel mode code. And that is, you know, one of the reasons why Windows was famous for being so unstable for many years, because all everybody kept putting junk in the kernel. <laughs> and Microsoft gradually made it more and more difficult to put junk in the kernel and had more and more enforced rules about what you put in there, because of course that stuff would conflict and crash. Now, if you can put malware in the kernel, those are kernel mode rootkits, and they're the most deadly kind of rootkit, the hardest to detect, the hardest to remove. Uh, they can hide better than anything else because they can subvert all your kernel mode calls so you cannot any longer do a directory of the file system or find them. So uh, that's good, clean fun. And then there's a related concept, the native API. This is the API that is not intended for normal programmers to use. It's the older internal Windows system process that was actually intended only to be used by people inside Microsoft. That's NTDIL. What you're supposed to use is kernel32.dil. Kernel32.dil is like control panel. It's an interface for normal, non-Microsoft people to be using. It offers certain functions. NTDIL is the um, internal API, the native API. And directly calling NTDIL includes what were intended to be undocumented functions only for Microsoft to use, but of course it's all leaked out now. So um, that's a thing to know. 
So if you find a program that's using calls to NT DIL functions, it's often malware. Although as we're gonna see, Notepad does it. <laughs> but anyway, so this is the point. And your, uh, some of your security programs trying to scan your machine for malicious activity will try to watch the calls in the kernel 32, but if you jump right into NT DIL, you'll get past it. And sort of like those uh, networking libraries um, that I mentioned before, these are harder to use, these NT DIL functions, so it's more convenient for normal developers to just use the kernel 32 functions. But of course, the whole point of uh, malware is they always try to do the unexpected thing to try to sneak past detection processes. So here's some popular native IPI calls to get information about your system. So you can try to figure out what your operating system is and what kind of antivirus you're running and things like that. And these are much more powerful than the uh, available calls in the uh, kernel 32 library. And NT continue will return from an exception. So I can trigger an exception and then return from it. And it's one way to get um, control code execution in a less obvious way. So let's go to 7C here. If I can find it. Well, that's rude. All right, let's see if I can find it up here. The way they punish me for not paying for this is they don't let me put it in folders or sort it very well. There it is. All right. All right. Lights. Okay. Give it a few more seconds. Your account more powerful than the administrator. All right, that's the system account. All right, what sign of service loads ring zero code? drivers running ring zero. The rest of that stuff does not necessarily. All right, where's the native API? Okay, NT Dill. Good, which we're going to play with quite a bit later. And uh, what happens when you divide by zero? All right, you use the exception handler. All right. So, Erica, all right. All right. Only two time winner that I know of. All right. So I'm going to stop recording and process it, but not stop sharing. It wasn't my plan. Uh, and I'll come back in about uh, 10 minutes to continue after I process this video.